brothers and sisters, at this time we don't have any prelude music, but the family will be coming in really shortly. So if we could uh, maintain a reverent and quiet um, time, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. All arise.
Thank you. Please be seated. Brothers and sisters, my name is uh, Andy Collins. I'm the bishop, and the Bascom family has asked me to conduct this meeting today. Joining me on the stand is my counselor, Brother Ben Galvin, and presiding at the meeting. Also on the stand is President, uh, uh, first pre uh, second counselor in the state presidency, uh, Brian Santiago. We'd like to thank the Nelson Family Mortuary for their preparation for these services. Um, we're grateful and express gratitude for the beautiful prelude music by um, Sister Bascom's grandson. Uh, as we come to celebrate Brooke and Brothers Bascom, who passed away peacefully on the 18th of July, surrounded by her loved and family members. Um, we extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here today, especially family members, and thank you for um, being here to celebrate the life of our good friend, Brooke Bascom. Um, I've reflected on Brooke and her funeral service. I have such fond memories of Brooke and, and her entire family. I remember when we first moved in 20 plus years ago, Brooke and Roger were one of the very first people to welcome us into the neighborhood and into the ward. And um, we were really lucky and fortunate to share and have some of Roger's wonderful baked goods. And, um, and Brooke made me very well aware that it was Roger that made those and not her. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful welcome and so grateful. And through the years, Brooke has been so kind to me as, as a neighbor. Um, Brooke was someone that I had a very great and wonderful relationship with. She wasn't afraid to tell me like a, how it was and what I needed to do. And she was also never shy to shower me with compliments and doing the things that I was doing well. And I really appreciated that. Um, in the very recent past, um, Brooke and Nikki would be outside gardening together, and Brooke was always sharing her feelings about her family and how much she loved them. And then she always said to Nikki how much she loved and adored Roger and how much she missed him and couldn't wait for the time that they could be together. I can only imagine the reunion they had on that evening of the 18th when they were reunited together and back in the arms of one another and also sharing the love of Bill and Ella and Brian who'd passed on before and other loved ones who had gone on before Brooke. Um, she was a wonderful person and the Oak Hills Six Ward and the Oak Hills neighborhood is better because of Brooke. And I got a little emotional last night at the viewing when I was watching the, uh, the video and I saw Sister Bascom and Sister Stewart with their primary children and how much love and appreciation they had and how much love and adoration these young children had. Brooke has touched the lives of so many individuals and so many youth over these years that they've lived in this ward that we'll all be eternally grateful. We'll begin our program now by singing hymn number 123, Oh May My Soul Commune With Thee, after which the invocation will be offered by Sister Lisa Brothers, Brooke's sister.
dearest Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for Brooke Ann Brothers Baskin, for everything that we've learned for, from her, and we're grateful that we had all these years, happy years together. We're also grateful that she's gone home to Roger, to her mom and dad and Brian and other loved ones. And we know that it's a beautiful reunion there, and we are so grateful for the knowledge of this through the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask blessings upon those who mourn her, her children, the 20 tender-hearted who call her Grandma Brooke, and we ask special blessings upon them, and especially for Jerem, as he is on his mission in Kansas. We do love thee dearly, and we would be remiss to not thank thee for our Savior, Jesus Christ, for his abiding love in us always, for his making possible the resurrection. We love him dearly. Please bless us with thy Holy Spirit as we enjoy this meeting. We say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I failed to mention the gratitude we have for Sister Katrina Baskin for being uh, our chorister today and uh, grateful for her as a daughter-in-law of Brooks. Uh, we'll go down as follows with the rest of the meeting. Um, we will begin with our uh, program by having uh, Brooks' daughter, Anne, be our first speaker. She'll be followed by a musical number by the grandchildren, Love One Another. Following that, Brandon will speak to us, and we'll have another musical number for my mother, which will be done, uh, or which will be sung by Sister uh, Lacey Reynolds, Brooke's daughter. We'll then have a musical number, um, I can't read it, Ash Book and Fare Farewell, Amazing Grace and How Great Thou Art, by uh, Sister Amy Henderson and Graydon Bascom, uh, playing the violin and the mandolin. And then we'll hear from Brother Graydon Bascom. We'll have a musical number, Where Can I Turn for Peace, with Brandon on the piano. And we'll go to that part of the program. Amy. Thank you so much for coming to celebrate our mom, sister, grandma, and friend. In the past, last few years where COVID made graveside memorial services more common, our mom would say, just hold a graveside service when I die, no one will come anyway. <laughs> so we are so grateful that you are here with us to defy her expectations and to remember her life. I'm grateful for the chance to talk about my mom today. Um, my mom had many loves in her life, and so I thought I would take this opportunity to just mention a few of, the, of those loves today. Um, my mom loved books and learning. Um, as she passed away, after she passed away, we started to gather up her library books. We found 63 of the 64 that she currently had checked out on her card. <laughs> And most of them had a bookmark in them, anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of the way through the book. <laughs> I don't know how she could be in so many books at one time, but she loved it. And she rarely went anywhere without a book in her purse. My mom loved chocolate. Um, she would tell me if a dessert wasn't chocolate, it wasn't worth eating. Now, that didn't necessarily keep her from eating it if it wasn't chocolate. <laughs> But if she had her choice, chocolate was that choice. My mom also loved flowers and weeding. She almost always had something growing on the kitchen table and in the living room in the years after I left the home. She would tell me, you can raise flowers or you can raise children, 
but you can't raise them both at the same time. <laughs> now, this may or may not be true because I know many people have been able to do both well, but <laughs> I wasn't one of them. And it was comforting to me all the same to be reminded that there are times and seasons in life and it was okay if I didn't even try to do all of them at once. My mom had a firm sense of right and wrong. Sometimes she and I would struggle if we had different ideas of what was right and what wasn't. But my mom never shied away for standing up for what she believed. She had a strong moral compass and she lived by it. And I'm proud of her for that. My mom loved being a mom and a grandma. When I was little, she would tell me that being a mom was the best job in the world. That, of course, didn't mean that it was easy for her or that it's easy for anyone. But she helped me to understand the importance of being a mom from a very young age. And she helped me to find the joy that we find in that calling. She loved her kids and her grandkids and the kids that she adopted into her home through marriage and through association. She believed in showing up and she did that to the very best of her abilities. After one of my sons was born, she could tell that I was not bouncing back well. And uh, she and Lacey came once a week for two months. They dug out the laundry, they dug out the bathrooms, they cooked dinner, they gave me a boost and got me back on my feet for another week. And did that for months until the day when she came and we were actually kind of ready for her. We'd done a little laundry and <laughs> she could tell that I was gonna be okay. And she was so good to show up. My mom really loved my dad. He was her dream. And she waited for him to receive the confirmation he needed for them to be together. They were the best of friends and companions on this earth for 42 years. And I know they are overjoyed for that companionship to continue. They were a seamless pair, one picking up where the other left off. My mom would read to my dad where he didn't love to read, and he would make dinner where she didn't love to cook. They would hold family parties and would work together in the kitchen, one cooking and one cleaning. Together, they taught us to love each other, to care for others, and the strength that the gospel brings into our lives. My mom loved the Lord. She learned how to respond to promptings. There would be times where she would call me and say, I was saying my prayers today and I had this thought. And then she would share with me something that had come to her mind and her heart. Some of the last things she shared with me have yet to happen, but I look forward to watching them unfold in the future. She had become strong in her prayers and her scripture study as well as the study she did for her primary lessons, and she loved sharing the gospel as she understood it with those primary children. Greater love hath no man or woman than this, that they lay down their life for their friends. We are Brooke's friends. She has laid her life aside for us and taught us how to love. Now we have the responsibility to share that love, which is the love and peace of Christ, with others in return. I know the Lord has a special place prepared for her, whereas my mom, where my mom will continue to learn and grow until the second coming. I know she will watch over her children and grandchildren, her family and her friends, who were so important to her in this life that she will not neglect us from the next. I know the joy of the gospel takes the sting of death and softens it. We are so blessed to have and share this knowledge. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen.
Well, here I am once more, one more time in the old Kills Chapel to put the fun in funeral. <clears throat> they say I have a face for radio. <clears throat> Mom died on Tuesday, and I left to take six of my college students to Rome on Wednesday. She was so excited for these students to perform, to have the opportunity to go and perform. When I was at Rome, when I was at the Rome Temple Visitor Center where we performed, one of the senior elders shared the following scripture with me. Doctrine and Covenants section 130, Verse 2, and this is instruction given by the prophet Joseph Smith in Ramos, Illinois, in April of 1843. And the same sociality which exists among us here will exist among us there, only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. To my own children, nieces and nephews, I know this means we will see Grandma again and we will be able to talk with her again. Elder Gong referenced the scripture in his talk, Happy and Forever. He said, the Lord who sees and understands perfectly forgives whom he will. We being imperfect are to forgive all. As we come to our savior, we focus less on ourselves. We judge less and forgive more. Trusting his merits, mercy, and grace can free us from contention, anger, abuse, abandonment, unfairness, and the physical and mental challenges that sometimes come with a physical body in a mortal world. Happy and forever do not mean that every relationship will be happy and forever, but a thousand millennial years may give us the needed time and surprising ways to love, understand, and work things out as we prepare for eternity. We can find sociality, heaven's sociality in each other. God's work and glory include bringing to pass happy and forever. Eternal life and exaltation are to know God and Jesus Christ, so through godly power, where they are, we shall be. End of quote. I called my mom almost every day. I want to share with you the things my mom was to me and others. She was a starfish chucker. Some of you may know the parable of the man that was throwing starfish and another man came up and said, what are you doing? Don't you know the starfish will just wash up again? And he says, well, it mattered to that one and he chucked another starfish. She will never know the long reaching effects of her reach and influence. I told her one day that her influence is, in, is affecting the lives of Fresno City College students that she's never met and she doesn't even know it. I've made many a set of flashcards like my mom made me. She loved to teach students how to read. She was tough. She stepped up when she needed to be tough and dad had lost his job and she went and took classes and got certified to teach. She was an old school school teacher. She wasn't tech savvy or quick, but she could turn out readers. Graydon and I are not going to miss the tech support calls. <laughs> she was the ultimate activity director and vacation planner. She was a survivor. She beat cancer twice that I know about. She loved teaching her primary class. She frequently told me about the members of her class and working with Karen Stewart. She was a crier. I got it too, thanks mom. <laughs> she, 
She wasn't the perfect mom, but she was the perfect enough mom for me. She loved her kids and wanted the best for them, and she did her best to give us everything she could. She stood at the crossroads and made sure we were safe. She worked once a week in my grandpa's dermatology office. She taught us how to work. We had chores. She made us weed the Pontella at the house in Grandview, where everyone else has grass between the sidewalk and the street. We had Pontella ground cover that she made us weed with her at night. The neighbor, kitty corner across the street, Ron Benson, would yell, plant grass. <laughs> and we would yell, yeah, mom, plant grass. <laughs> but she later told us she did it so she could spend time with us and talk with us. She was a list maker. Oh, the dreaded lists. She sat on the bench and practiced with me. She made me lists of things to practice. She was organized, and then she wasn't organized at all. She was stubborn. She taught us what was right, and when we didn't necessarily do what was right or the way she wanted, she was sure to let other people know that she did raise these kids right. Whether or not they chose to do what was right, she did her job in teaching us what was right. We had scripture study. We had morning devotionals. She was a warrior. And about the most trivial to me things, this of course made it so easy to pull her leg and get her goat. Do you think your dad is going to come and get me? No, nah, I think he found a younger lady with blonde hair. Thanks to her dentist, who put her mind at ease when he said, I know Roger. And he's a covenant keeper. He'll be there to pick you up. She was a prankster. Two of her favorite pranks that she liked to tell and retell were when she went to the Navy base driving her dad's car with his Navy captain's sticker on it with her friends. The on-duty officer had to salute the car. <laughs> so they kept circling through again and again <laughs> to get that salute. The other was she called up her BYU home evening brothers late at night and said, Daddy, I'm ready to be picked up from the movies trying to get him to go out and pick up this little girl. I'm sorry, little girl, I'm not your daddy. Oh no, what, what am I gonna do? That was my last dime. <laughs> she didn't dare go to breakfast the next morning because she wouldn't be able to keep a straight face. <laughs> she had a testimony of prayer. All too often, I'm afraid I was the reason for her prayers. She prayed for her kids and grandkids by name every day. Sometimes you'd all, uh, sometimes you'd even find a written out prayer list in her home. She said she didn't want a mansion, just a cottage with flowers. Harvey, brother, she loved you. She talked about you all the time. Thank you for your testimony on Sunday. She loved to tell me the story you beautifully told about the library and the kids walking reverently. She loved to tell me about how you scared the devil out of her at day's market. There are so many to thank in this ward, and I don't even know the half of them. 
Thanks to the Despains and the Zimbrenans for being such great ministers to her. Thanks to Glee and Brother Overton. She would tell me about the pies from Croshaw's and St. George it would bring her. Thanks to the neighbors across the street. She talked about you all the time. David Taylor, she talked about you and your kids helping her with her leaves. Thanks, Len and Lisa, for never getting your washer or dryer fixed. To spend time with her, check in on her and take her to lunch. She never figured that one out. I feel her greatest accomplishment is the things her children, grandchildren, and those she loved accomplish. We can honor and keep her legacy alive by following her righteous example. As cliche as it is, the Abraham Lincoln quote fits. Everything that I am, I owe to my angel mother. I'll talk to you later, Mom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Mom always wanted a concert, so <laughs> we tried. Um, or I grew up going to lots and lots of concerts. <laughs> but um, that's how Mom was. She always wanted us to achieve our dreams. Uh, when I think of my dear mother, I'm reminded of four principles of the gospel, faith, hope, charity, and love. Um, so I'll just go through them. <laughs> so faith. Mom was raised in a strong family. Her testimony of the gospel was deep. She loved teaching in the church, especially when she was serving in primary. When I came to visit her, she would tell me about the children in her class. And she would miss them when they went on each year to the next class. <laughs> and she, she had her favorites too that she'd follow. And I'm sure in the ward people have been used to her checking in on them. Faith is a principle of action. There are many examples of my mother's faith blessing people and, the, and blessing especially me and my family. Um, as the youngest child, I had the unique opportunity to hear her prayers for all, for all my siblings, wherever they were, whether it was school or missions or raising young families. She would pray for our exams or our difficult companions or our sick babies or our job opportunities. I remember once, I think three of us were looking for a job at once, <laughs> and the whole family was praying for all of us, and, and Mom would orchestrate all that with Dad. When my first son was born, Doxford, he was struggling on limited oxygen. And it was my sweet mother who reported to me all the temple prayer rolls across the world that his name was on. Katrina and I felt those prayers carry us through the daily challenges of neonatal specialist rounds and the unknown future of having a baby with brain damage. When my boys were younger, she dubbed Jurgen her temple open house guide in an effort to help our rowdy boys be reverent when we visited the newly constructed temples. Every time we went to lunch, she'd look for Jurgen to hold her hand and walk her through. My mom's and hope, my mom's hope was for her children and grandchildren. She gave everything she could to further develop our talents and academic goals, and most important, importantly, our knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. She actively attended sporting events, dance recitals, plays, musical performances, art shows, and reading days. She often was accused of interrogating people. However, her questions reflected her hope for the person she was talking with. She was supportive of every individual's desire to improve themselves. A few weeks ago, I took her to purchase a new phone. <laughs> and by the time we left, she knew the salesman's mission, his plan to go to school, to find the right girl and to be married in the temple. <laughs> Mom was always reinforcing and building us up, always allowing us to grow at our own pace. I joke that I broke my mother's heart when I quit the piano at age six, but in truth, she cheered me on in my other pursuits. Um, she was extremely proud of her family's success and ready with words of comfort in our struggles. Charity, when mom befriended someone, they became hers forever. I was often blessed to witness her efforts from the car she would visit friends with rotisserie chickens or sunflowers from her garden or a written note. As a boy, I remember being frustrated with the length of these visits. <laughs> but in hindsight, there were many instances where she was led by the Spirit. She helped my best family, my best friend Miles' family find their home in the ward <laughs> before it was listed on the market. <laughs> she sent me to mow lawns for widows or move furniture for people when it was needed. In the Moroni chapter 7, verse 47, it says, But charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with them. I, When we had new babies, she was always there to cook for us and, and bathe the baby and hold the baby and take care of us. Um, a tender mercy of our stay in the hospital were the many friends who came to see her and who were going to miss her. And, and I know that she was loved dearly by this ward. She was stubborn about staying here <laughs> till the end, and, and she went out on her terms. Um, and then love. My mother loved so many people. She, she loved the song Mama by Old Devo and wanted Brandon and me to sing it, but <laughs> I don't think we could get through it. <laughs> but there's a line in it that says, Mama, thank you for who I am, and thank you for all the things I'm not. I'm so grateful for my mother's love and her sacrifices for me. 
her Christ-like love for everyone around her and her testimony of the gospel, which was uh, demonstrated in her daily actions. I know that the gospel's true and that we will see her again, that she is with her love, beloved Roger, and that they are overseeing their grandchildren grow. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brad, and that was beautiful, as well as all the other musical numbers and the talks given today. What a wonderful, what a wonderful time we've been able to spend together. I love funerals. I, I think they're probably my favorite meeting. We learn so much about individuals that 
we didn't know or that we had forgotten or just remembering what wonderful people they are. And there's no exception here with, um, with Sister Bascom and learning about things and, and even being her neighbor for 20 plus years, what I learned about her. In fact, um, as I was having the opportunity to spend time with Lacey and Amy at the hospital, um, those first few days when, when Brooke had come out of surgery and they said, yeah, we're doing everything we can to get mom to respond and to um, have her talk and come out of her coma. And I said, oh, really? And, she's, and I think it was Lacey said, yeah, we even had the dog on the phone. And I said, oh, she loved dogs? And, she, and they said, no, she despises dogs. <laughs> and, uh, and for 20 plus years, my dogs have been over at Brooke's house and running around in her yard. And spending time with Brooke and I thought man Brooke's so lucky she just loves these dogs and these dogs just love Brooke so so we learn something new every day and uh, and I'm grateful that Brooke was so kind about that um, the other thing that I've not learned today but I've known throughout my life and being around Brooke is how fiercely loyal and proud she is of her family and particularly her children and again in speaking with Lacey and Amy at, uh, at the hospital and when we knew the end was near and we were discussing when the funeral would be and the arrangements and they said, well, we've got we've to wait and, and Brandon's going to, to Rome and, and we need to wait and get back. And, and they said, we definitely need to wait until Brandon gets back because he is mom's favorite. And I thought, <laughs> I don't know the, the ins and outs, but I do know this, that she certainly didn't uh, portray that to, to me. And, how proud she was of each of you and the love she had for you and your and your and her grandchildren, your children, was inspiring. And um, it was evident too that the love was was mutual. As you'd, we'd see the van and the suburbans roll up and the kids come out and and grandma come out and and welcome them with open arms and having so much joy and happiness. And it was just it was inspiring to me as a neighbor and a friend to see that love. Um, when I come to funerals, I often reflect on my own um, life and the people who have passed and gone on before me. <clears throat> and oftentimes, I think of, uh, of my father. That's who usually comes to the forefront of my mind. And sometimes I get sad and a little distraught thinking, man, I really miss him and I really wish he were here. And I don't think it's, you know, it's not fair that my kids couldn't have got to know him better and had someone who is such a champion of people have them and his or have him in their lives and I would say that to to you as, as the Bascom family that it is sad and it is lonely sometimes but knowing that it's part of the plan and that Heavenly Father knows exactly what our needs are and through the atonement of Jesus Christ that we'll be reunited and that we'll be able to have a glorious reunion um, I had a good friend who said, we will struggle and fall down and we'll pick ourselves up and go through additional challenges and fall down again and we'll get back up and we'll fall down again. And then he said, come what may and love it. And I kind of thought about that and I thought, well, I think that means that there's always going to be peaks and valleys in our lives and there's going to be sadness and there's going to be times when we lose loved ones and things are seem difficult. But I know that as we learn from these times, we become stronger and we become happier as a result. Um, I know in, in conclusion, I just want to say, um, a prophet of God stated, Heavenly Father loves you. That love never changes. It's simply there for you. When you're sad, happy, discouraged, or hopeful, God's love is there for you, whether you feel you deserve it or not. Um, it's simply there. Brothers and sisters, I believe this to my absolute core. I know that my Heavenly Father loves me. I know that he loves each of you. I know that there are times when you're feeling down and discouraged. He's there and he will stand and he'll buoy you up and he'll make you whole and he'll make you feel good. In Mosiah 16, 7 through 9, it states, And if Christ had not risen from the dead or have broken the bands of death, that grave should have no victory and that death should have no sting. There could have been no resurrection. But there is a resurrection. Therefore, the grave hath no victory and the sting of death is swallowed up in Christ. He is the light and the life of the world, yea, a light that is endless, that can never be darkened, yea, and also a life which is endless, that there can be, that there can be no more death. 
I know this to be true, brothers and sisters. I know Brooke is a light, and I know she has been a light in so many people's lives. I will miss that late night family room light on as I went to bed late at night. I'm a little bit of a night owl, and I always knew that Brooke's family room light was on and that she was probably writing lists and writing notes and prayer rolls for her loved ones. I'll miss that dearly. But I know that Brooke is in a place where she is loving being with her husband and loving being with loved ones who have passed on. I know the gospel is true. I know the atonement of Jesus Christ is real. And I know we will all be reunited with our loved ones. And I say these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we'll now have some remarks by President Santiago. Following President Santiago's remarks, our benediction will be uh, hymn number 165, Abide With Me, Tis Even Tide. And our benediction will be given by Sister Jan Woolley, Brooke's sister. Following that, um, we'll, go, we'll go to that point. I'm grateful to uh, be in the Sixth Ward, to have Bishop Collins be our bishop. Uh, we, we have a lot of conversations uh, about the incredible people of this ward. And I'm super grateful for his testimony, testimony of the Savior. I too believe that uh, Roger and Brooke are alive. And I also testify to you that they're close. Amy, Lacey, Graydon, and Brandon, they're with you. And they'll walk the path with you and these beautiful children and grandchildren. Brooke didn't miss much, uh, whether it was the conversations when I'd pass by the library and she'd let me know what did and did not need to happen in the ward. Uh, the <laughs> uh, what did and did not need to happen at, in BYU athletics. <laughs> she, she didn't miss much. Uh, when the lights did and did not need to turn off in our home, uh, whether we were home or away, she knew. And she would let me know. Uh, she startled me. A couple of weeks ago, Kim and I were out for a late night walk and she was laying down uh, just off the side of the road. And your first instinct is, oh, there's something not okay because she's just laying there in the dirt and pulling these weeds <laughs> late at night. It's not, not something that I do ever. But uh, our instinct was, hey, can we help you? Can we, oh no, oh no, carry on. I'm just out here making sure things are clean. Um, Brooke was a dear friend. And uh, I echo what Bishop Collins said. There rarely was a time in our conversations where she didn't either talk of the four of you and the grandchildren where she didn't express heartfelt concern for you, for your well-being. And uh, I'm so grateful that I was able to be here today just to feel the spirit of your words, your expression of gratitude for your mother and for those beautiful, beautiful musical renditions. Uh, I was also made aware, Graydon, that there's another instrument I don't play. so great uh, but I just want to testify to all of you and add my testimony to those that have been born uh, and express the love of President Woodruff and President Oz from the state presidency uh, President Woodruff was there last night and asked me to be here today I just want to testify to you that the Savior is real that it's not by chance that we're here and that we come here as families and that that love that we feel although the sting of death is real the hope of the resurrection is so beautiful. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
perfect and gracious Heavenly Father, we express gratitude to gather together. To honor my blessed daughter, Brooke, I express gratitude for her life. courage, for her love and devotion and dedication to all of those that she touched throughout her life. We express gratitude for her legacy of being a righteous woman and pray that legacy will carry on in the lives of her children and grandchildren, that they too may reach out and touch others especially with their testimonies, which she lived true to. We're grateful for our Savior, who showed great love through the sacrifice that he brought to pass in the atonement and resurrection that brings hope to us that we too will once again be reunited we pray for those who are left behind, that they may feel of thy love and peace. And know that thou art there as well as Roger and Brooke. We express gratitude for all of thy blessings and do so in the name of thy beloved son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, if we could now have the Paul Bears, Brandon Bascom, Graydon Bascom, Dallin Henderson, Jeremy Reynolds, Damian Henderson, Tate, or Taryn Henderson, Kurt Bascom, Luke Bascom, come forward at this time. We ask that the members of the congregation remain in their seats till the family members have exited. Oh, please stand. Thank you. This now concludes the funeral for Sister Brooke Bascom.